Welcome to yet another fabulous installment of World Voices, which is a series of international uh, visitors and readers here in Singapore, hosted by our very own The Arts House, which used to be our very first parliament building, in case you didn't know that. So you are in the presence of greatness. Right? And so are we. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, we have with us tonight a very, very special guest. Uh, I met him earlier this year. Uh, at the Stanza Scottish International Poetry Festival. And we had a lovely chat. That, that's in a podcast. You can look it up on Google. Just, just Google Ryan Van Winkle and Elvin, something like that, and you'll you get us. And I got to find out that he's based in Edinburgh. He's originally from the US somewhere, somehow. Found his way to the UK, to Scotland, of all places. And he's happily attached to the Scottish Poetry Library. So he gets there, he runs podcasts, he runs events in Edinburgh. He's also a published poet. He's published with Salt. His collection, Tomorrow We Will Live Here, uh, is there. Hold it up over there. And he's been picked up by The Guardian as a voice to watch in poetry. He does some really interesting things. Apparently, he pulls people into a room and makes them cry. He's pretty much at the cutting edge of poetry. We will just have a very casual conversation and reading tonight. We've had a few drinks, but we had one. Uh, yeah, so he's had two. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming here to Singapore for the very first time my dear friend and poet, Ryan Van Wink. How is everybody? You okay, sorry for, for being late. I don't, I'm not from here. <laughs> <laughs> so I just do what I'm told. Um, thanks so much for coming. You well? Everybody's well? Do you talk? Are you a chatty audience? <laughs> yes. Yes. Good. Thank you. Yes. Don't leave me out there on my own. All right. So I'll start. A, I'll start with a little poem. Um, so I guess I guess the thing. Um, I grew up in America. My accent, and uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So I grew up in America, and I moved to the UK, and, and after I'd kind of moved over, I read this book about the notion of travel and going places and doing things, and um, there's this quote from Bill McKibben that starts starts the collection, which says, he says, "Why leave when you can live in a place you can understand, and that understands you," and. That upset me because I had left home, and, I, and Bill McKibben kind of had, had this, this notion that in any small town that you're from or any place that you live, there's an infinite amount of stories and history, and isn't it wonderful that if you're paying attention, there's no matter, there's, there's, there's an untold amount of drama and, and things that could be happening in the place that you are, you might not necessarily need to leave. And of course, I'd done that, and I started to question my own decisions. Um, so this first poem is kind of about that. And um, it's called My 100-Year-Old Ghost. My 100-Year-Old Ghost sits up with me when the power cuts, tells about the trout at Unkey's Lake, the wood house burned on the hill. He says he was intimate with every leaf of grass, wore one hat for Griswold, another for his own field. The possibilities of the century laid out an endless string of fishing pools, but they never got ahead of my ghost. He took them like cows, one at a time, never lusted for the color of trout in a pool a mile away. He knew from the smoke in the sky Mrs. Johnson was starting supper, and in March, when the candles appeared, he knew Bobby's boy had died. My ghost only ever had one bar where the keeper didn't water his drinks, nor did he feel the need to hide his moth cap, his potato clothes, or scrub himself birth pink. My ghost tells me there was a time you'd look out and not find a dairy queen. You could sit on your porch a whole life, he said, and never think about China. Sometimes I see my ghost bringing cut sunflowers to his wife and it seems so simple. Then, sometimes it is dark, 
He's just in from work, and Griswold says they ain't going to raise his pay. And even back then, the power went out, long nights when they had no kerosene. And my ghost tries to sell me on simpler times, the grass soft, endless, lampless nights, pools of crickets singing. Uh, let's see what I'll read next. Uh, let's talk a little bit about... This is a very short poem. Anybody a fan of Frank Zappa in the house? No? Yes? Woo? No. no. Good. Fine. Don't be a fan of Frank Zappa. <laughs> If you were, I'd have something to say, but I don't. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's the, my introduction, totally scupper. We can pretend. No, don't bother, don't bother. Um, this, is, this is called The Day He Went to War. The day he went to war was bright, white, and clean. An advertisement for fresh laundry, lady things, or whatever. We watched him from Joe's garage, our music clanging, hubcaps and tin cans thrown against cement. We watched his mother watch the car that took him, saw her wave at nothing. Then we took it from the top. One, two, a one, two, three, four. Should we talk about something fun like, you know, let's talk about death. <laughs> <laughs> Destruction and wars. Let's stay on that theme for a little bit. Um, so, do you guys know a character named Kenny Ritchie by any chance? Probably not. Kenny Ritchie was a was a, a Scottish man. He ended up moving to America. Now, at some point while he was living in America, he joined the army. He was quite Americanized. He joined the army, and um, his girlfriend broke up with him. Now, I don't know what you do when your girlfriend breaks up with you, uh, or your boyfriend. Kenny Ritchie took maybe a slightly drastic uh, measure and burned her house down. <laughs> <laughs> with, with her in it? Well, no, even oh. sadder. Unfortunately, unfortunately she would, no, unfortunately there was, there was a baby in that house, and that baby died. Now, he ended up on death row. Americans like death row. Uh, I guess some other people do too. <laughs> so I don't know, and nobody knows, you know, and then Amnesty International really protested this whole movement, right? And he went from appeal to appeal to appeal. And one day, was, I'm sitting in Edinburgh, and, uh, you know, it's raining, it's been raining, which was the kind of city where, like, it'll rain for just three months straight, you know? Uh, there's a reason it's very green. And, and, and there was a quote from Kenny Ritchie in the newspaper just before his last, last appeal, which said, uh, my dying wish is to stand outside naked in the Scottish rain and to feel it soak me. And uh, I thought, yeah, okay, maybe if you're about to be killed, that makes some sense. Uh, <laughs> really, I'd just like to be dry right now. Uh, but I did think about it a lot. And so I, he ended up, well, I'll tell you what happened to him after. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. This poem will not give you any information or facts. Please do not mistake any of these poems uh, for information or facts. This is not the news. Ode from a for it's called Ode for a Rain from Death Row. The rain is a cold, clean prayer. The only light I want to see. I say it still rains on her like it rains on the bars and streets somewhere outside the walls. And in the rain she is always twenty, her shoes always candy red converse, her jeans always damp to her thighs, her mouth never parted from mine. She hasn't pressed her lips to glass since the fire, the ashes are back to ashes, the dust follows dust. The spring rain powders her arms and evaporates in the stare of the sun. And this rain is the only light I want to see, 
a mist that kisses till my socks are sponge, till the fire fizzles and baby is back again, cooing with hot chocolate warm hands. Before I die, I want to stand outside, birth naked, let the Lord soak me. But options and partings are gone. The priest only offers a glass, where my throat wants a holy rain that pours in sheets and hoods and lasts for 40 days till it floods and floats my sins away. Um, <clears throat> Kenny did not get executed in America. Um, he did get sent back to Scotland, uh, where he was promptly arrested uh, for beating up his grandmother. <laughs> Who says there's no such thing as a happy ending? Um, September 11th. <laughs> keeping it light. Alvin said to keep it light. It was joyful, happy. Um, so it's a number of them, again, a very, very, comp very complicated issue. Um, uh, a couple of things I have to say about it. Uh, one was, uh, no, one thing I'll say about it was the most interesting thing to me, I, I, I don't usually write particularly political poems, um, but uh, one thing that interested me, there was a documentary after, a few years afterwards, where it talked about these, these people, these men predominantly, who, who on September 11th took that as an opportunity to run, to like basically take their, any identifying features, throw them into the rubble, and just split and leave town and start a new life. Ditch their wife and family or whatever it was, quit their, you know, they didn't quit their job, they just left, they're just dead. For all intents and purposes, dead. And I thought, that's pretty cool. I mean, I understood the mo notion of like wanting to get out, uh, I think. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and so, so yeah, so I wrote a poem about it. Stupid thing to say. That's a shitty introduction. <laughs> so I, I've been doing one-on-one -on -one poetry performances for the last three weeks, so I'm not used to um, people. <laughs> <laughs> This is called, I got out when it all went down. I'm no longer dead in the morning, fetal and afraid to start the day. I don't get stuck in the subway or scan the shadows of streets. This life is better than Betty and all that was, but lately the lights flicker whenever I walk past. I don't know. Maybe it's just the hard labor, but I feel the dark, and nobody in nice town knows about dust. It's starting to itch me what I did, and maybe Pennsylvania isn't far enough. Maybe there is a place you can pull peaches and oranges from trees. I wake from dreams thinking I am not a soul. Then, last night in the bar, they were all watching Fox News again. Nobody looked at me. And I wanted to say it was best what happened. I never liked those buildings. Their shadows froze everything. Mornings walking into their long trench coats was like walking into slabs of ice. And once I saw Betty where I did not expect to see her, hailing a cab way the fuck down on 15th, and I thought, Christ, I was not where I should have been. That morning, I started for work a little late. Ditched my phone near the chaos, crashed at the Port Authority. And it is a small comfort that my photo hung on the walls with the murder that maybe she'll have enough money now. I like to picture her going to that hole, the sun on her face and a new man on her arm, safe, thinking my bones are buried, that the past is the past is the past, and I am not coming home. Thanks, man. Um, is there another poem? Does anybody want to say anything to me? You don't have to clap. You can clap. You can do anything you want. It's a free country. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can sort of trade to in the clap at the end. Yeah, no, I, I prefer that. I like, what I like the most about the poetry reading is how nobody claps or seems to enjoy themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Because it, it, can, it, it, it continues that sad level of neuroses of the poet. I, I, love reading, I, I love reading in the UK because you know, all these stern faces, right? You look like you're, you're, you're reading to uh, an auditorium full of Cambridge examiners. Uh, and then they all have this, this look. And you know, we're conditioned to look at, at Brits like Cambridge examiners. Right? And then they come up at the end after the reading and go, tell you. <laughs> do you ever do you, do you guys get do you guys have the po, do you guys have the pogasm? What's that? The pogasm is like the like if you really are sex is not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 if you're at a poetry and you like the poem, sometimes you hear from like yeah, yeah. Uh, some old uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's really it's really off putting. <laughs> I'd much rather you snap or yeah. No, especially especially in, 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 in Many readings in the UK, especially I know, they're lovely, gorgeous audiences, uh, but they tend to be of a certain age. Yeah. And so they're sort of, um, yeah, you, you get, you get, you get, you get, sort of homemakers and their husbands, and they're like in their fifties and sixties. So they're out in the dark, and you read any rocket poem, and they go. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, let's get sexy. That's that's hence the one. Um, yeah, I'll read, a little, I'll read a little bit of a longer one here. Um, it's called Everybody Talking About Jesus. It, it's, it starts with a little bit of a story, which is kind of a true story. Actually, I used to introduce this by telling the story, and then I realized, actually, it's in the poem, so why bother? It's a lousy introduction. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's the last time I'm taking out the drinks before. Oh. <laughs> I needed more. I think I probably just needed more. <laughs> All right, everybody talking about Jesus in three parts. One, I got a girl up the attic the summer I turned ten. Her shirt went damp, and we played a game where I'd strip, and she'd slap my calves with my dead grandma's cane. One afternoon, she took my clothes and left me up with the heat and the dust, mothballs fermenting like apples. I was nailed in. She had lunch or baked bread, played nurse with her dolls or something. I could hear my mother, her vacuum scowl. I saw the sunlight snatch the shadows, heard my father slam the door. After the third hour, the girl rose with my clothes and a switch from her yard. I was so happy, I took it all, her arms sweating like horses. My father and sister never knew, but in that house, noise always dried like palm. After Dad's funeral, everybody was talking about Jesus and how we should all listen to what he said. Two. Sis and I purge his boxes of books, finding a faded Polaroid of a redhead that was not my mother. Garters cling to her thighs, and her ass is wide and rosy as if slapped or left out from the December snow. I guess I always knew my dad was not a pious man. It's sick, my sister says, but my eyes stay on the woman, recognizing her from the back row of graduation and high school plays. My sister sticks the photo between parched papers, and I think about dozens of times I saw the make of Dad's car parked down side roads, but never checked the plates. I was the good boy, the one he wanted. Three. I'm still up in the attic, going red with the girl, the color of my hair lapsing. And I feel so naked in Dad's house with my sister, I walk around modest, like my balls are tucked into a loincloth. And at night, in the old house, the house he willed to her, I keep thinking about Jesus, about all the talk, and how they all say to obey. We don't know if he was an alcoholic or kept 
the mistress. We don't know how badly he wanted to be on that cross. But the house, I keep thinking, I could use that scratch. These days, Rosie wants pregnant so bad I barely touch her. So before Sis goes to bed, I tell her we can split everything. Dad left me the car. You can have half the car. But no, she says. The car's seen too many stations she doesn't want to think about. She spits her toothpaste and I watch the light beneath her door until it's gone. Stay in the house. Uh, anybody live with their partners? You guys are really <laughs> killing these introductions. <laughs> no? Yeah. Yes. What? Yes. Yeah, that sounds really enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, but yeah. It's, um, it's hard. For a lot of us, signing a lease will be maybe the uh, closest thing we'll get to marriage. Um, play a little game uh, with yourself and, ask, and, and wonder, you know, try to guess how it all worked out. It's called the apartment. Our new walls, empty in the dusk, hang like sheets before first light. There is a driven nail by the stove that could hold a pan if the walls stay sturdy, and the old tenants left a mirror in the bedroom which looks back at staring walls with fine cracks like a museum's basement face. There are brown smears in the study, chocolate, blood, or shit. We don't know what will happen to us here or what will settle on rented walls or if nothing will settle at all. We've just moved, and already we are bitter cranberries in each other's mouths, biting about photos, the place of the table, lay of the bed. The apartment is a city hall we cannot fight, so we turn like lawyers against each other. Let the walls stare. There is a mirror to look into, a nail to hang onto, our unopened boxes hiding corners and closets like beaten children. And we will take the blood off the walls and the dust from the shelves. We have one year together in a place that is empty at dusk and feels like fog inside and between us and Christ. Tomorrow we will live here. Stop there for a chat? Yeah, that's fine. That was obviously where the title of the collection comes from. Yes, it is not, as somebody thought, a, uh, a first, somebody read it as in, tomorrow we will live here. Like, <laughs> yes, that, I don't know how he came to that reading. Um, I obviously didn't do my job very well. <laughs> no, but, but there's also the sense, I mean, coming from where you came from, going to where you went. There's also the sense of picking up, packing up your bags and moving to a different place, a different end, and obviously to some degree uncertain, but this the sense of picking up and setting up somewhere else. I mean, that's surely part of, of your writing as well. I think the book. Yeah, I think this book was very much me trying to understand. My dad said the worst thing in the world to me once. Uh, he said, you know, when I was your age, I always wanted to have a nice house and a wife and some kids. Uh, now I have those things. Yeah, I don't really care for them that much anymore. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I think you know that that was really the spirit of me writing this book was like this notion of like the decisions you make. There's a lot of men in conflict with characters in conflict with like the decision they had made, and they weren't sure if they were right. You know, and I don't think we know until we get a little bit of perspective. And of course, by that point, it's kind of too late. And I kind of really felt that. I think, like having moved, I think that amped up that that feeling. And, and I was just struck by the number of poems you have about houses and property, uh, housing and property. They're big, big things, uh, existential questions here in Singapore, in particular. <laughs> uh, you, know, 80, you know, we were talking on, on the way here, I was telling him about over 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing. Uh, what I did tell you that in order to get public housing, in order to qualify to buy public housing, you have to be a family unit. That means you have to be married, 
or over 35 single or living with parents, etc., etc. So you have to form a family. So, so getting a house isn't just about getting a house. You have to settle down into some sort of record, socially acceptable shape. Um, and then, and then, yeah, exactly. And that, that plugs in very much too. You, you have to make those decisions fairly early. Yeah, it's really hard, right? Like, yeah. it's a really, and you just don't know. You don't know. You're young, and you have no clue about whether or not you're doing it right. And I was in a relationship, and we were both like, we should move in together. That's what we're supposed to do. And yeah, it was a total failure. <laughs> was that what brought? I don't know, it wasn't mine. Was that what brought? Was that what brought, was that what brought you over to the UK? No, I thought New Year's Eve in 1999 was going to be cracking. I thought I heard that in New Year's Eve in Scotland. People will make out on the streets. So I thought for 1999 there would be full on bodies moving around together. And uh, writhing down the Yeah, I thought it was going to be a huge or and, and it turned it was mostly just urine and vomit. <laughs> Bodily fluids. A lot of fluid, a lot of fluids, but not for the right reasons. <laughs> so what was it like? For the first couple of years, must. What 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 did you have to change your mind about? Oh man, what was it I didn't change my mind about anything. I stayed a loyal American for a very. I think that the, the, like the cultural, uh, what's it called? The cultural uh, culture shock is so minor mm -hmm. in a way as to like you don't even notice it. You just. But I would feel like quite angry and annoyed all the time, and I just thought that was just me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and eventually, I guess I got used to like how you're supposed to interact in this kind of vaguely bizarro America, as it turned out, you know, or America bizarro UK, you know, like from Superman. Um, and not that either are particular. Well, they're both pretty bizarre in their own way. But then, I mean, things, little things. It was like I was just angry that I was angry that I couldn't order a, like a curry. And get rice. I, they always had to get give, get an extra two dollars out of you, two pounds out of you, pay for rice. And I was like, who the f is buying curry, not ordering rice? Like, <laughs> come on! Like, you know, they go just put it in the price. Just put it. Don't make me give you. And that that kind of thing drove me crazy. <laughs> uh, and then eventually you stop. Then you know, occasionally I would be like, oh man, wouldn't it be nice if it was warm? But <laughs> that, that took a while. That took like eight years to get over. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, sunshine, whatever. Who needs it? Being <laughs> yeah, outdoors is overrated, isn't it, guys? Yeah, I'm gonna wake the audience up and ask for ask for some some chatter from from the floor. Anyone have have anything to ask, Brian? Yeah, can, 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 me, can anybody just get a bottle of white wine over there? <laughs> Where are you from, in America? Thank you. Great question. Connecticut. Oh, okay. Want me to spell it? You can spell it? Not New Haven. <laughs> Not New Haven. Not, Not, New Haven. Not near New Haven. Very near to New Haven. Haven. Yeah. Have you been to Connecticut? Yeah. I'm from the US. No way. But that doesn't mean you've ever been to Connecticut. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> yeah. Or want to. Or want to be. I mean, you've driven through it, I imagine. No, not yet. Have you no, been I to mean, Yale? No, I, I, not to Yale, but I went to Yale to visit some. Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you go eat pizza? Did you have the pizza? The pizza. No. Sally's or Peppy's, the best pizza in America. You, go, you went to yeah. 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 There's like, but like, it turned out like we were from uh, White Sands. Do you know White Sands Beach near um, Sabro? No, what's it called? What's the place with all the skeet ball and all that stuff? Old Sabro. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not Old Sabro. So I can't remember the name. Anyways, it doesn't matter. That's weird. That's a random connection. Geography is hilarious. <laughs> what's skeet ball? Skeet ball. Skeet ball. You know, like it's like. Um, you, <laughs> nothing to do with poetry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so you know, you bowl up a ramp, and then the ball jumps, and it can get into like the the middle or another ring. There's rings, uh, it's like and then darts. The, what's that? It's like darts. It's like darts, but with balls. 
And you get like a little raffle ticket comes out, and you get like a thousand of them. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah, buy yeah. like a cap gun. <laughs> we have the fun fairs where we do that. Yeah, yeah. Is it called ski? Is it not called ski? No, no. It's called a ripoff. Yeah, it is a ripoff. Yeah. 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 How 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 do you define creative poetry? How do I define creative poetry? Yeah. As opposed to uncreative poetry. <laughs> I guess anything that's not plagiarism. <laughs> um, is everything plagiarism? No, no, there is definitely not everything is plagiarism. Yeah. Everything is borrowed? Everything is borrowed. Borrowing is not plagiarism. No, yeah. Borrowing is not stealing. Yeah. Uh, I just yeah. want to ask, like, um, I mean, this is a weird question, but what kind of poet do you see yourself as? Like, your style of writing, how would you define yourself? Creative. Oh, wow. I was really hoping you wouldn't follow that sentence. I could just say handsome. <laughs> uh, um, I don't. I guess. I guess. Uh, what would you define as? Um, and you find more than I do. I'm, I'm pretty stupid on these things. Published. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, it's a big hit, right? I'm not a formalist. I'm not avant-garde. I guess they would call. They would say lyrical. I think some people would say lyrical, right? That, that would be the more or less. Yeah. I mean, I, I. A lot of a lot of what I. What I write, I'm supposed to be put in the same category very often. You've seen my books. Yeah, you're not a formalist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ly lyrical, fairly free verse, very loose, fairly conversational. I'm trying to go more avant-garde, though. I really admire the avant-garde, and I really think um, I worked really hard to make this book understood. Uh, and I'm kind of against. I'm, I'm moving away from that. I'm kind of bored of being understood. Yeah. Uh, less yeah, I don't know. Yeah, somebody says to me, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't poetry doesn't need to be understood. It needs to be. So I've been moving towards the idea that like a good poem can be felt, and I, I've been moving towards this notion of like the deep image and what what that means. Like, what does it? Do you know? Do you guys know about the deep image? I never. I just heard this term recently. The deep imagery. Deep image. It's like it's a good example of a deep image. Like. Your sorrows will be carried on the backs of ten thousand mice, all and sung on the, and sung in, in in the throats of uh, the, tu, the Tuvian throat singers or something. Like it's an image that doesn't make any sense, but it feels like something, you know. And you can kind of understand, it, but you can't understand it the way jazz works, I guess. Is it language poetry? Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. But yeah, because, language poetry. Is because awesome. you, you can you can you can do the image. I mean, too much stuff about that. It can be lyrical. It just doesn't appear to make obvious sense. So we'll start with this thing. And it makes, it makes us also an unconscious or psychological sense. Possibly. Robert Bly. Yeah, Robert yeah. Bly had a great poem. I can't remember now what it's called, but it's a good one. So I, I'm going to get... Uh, we've got a couple of questions, but just remind me to read one of those newer poems. So you've got that sure. Yeah. 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 Um, just to give an example of what you mean. Uh, but we've got a question over from the back from the London oh, Russian media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read like an article about the Korean processes of different writers. Like Flaubert used to take cold baths, and then the others used to breakfast with opiates. And I mean, do you have something you can share with us so we can also benefit from that? Uh, I just try to get really sad. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I don't have like a. I don't know, I drink a lot and, and I get high when I can. Um, can I say that? Yeah, I'm sorry. You live in Scotland. I'm not going to give you my address, man. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, what, else, what else do I do? Yeah, no, I, do no, I do nothing. I, I don't force it and I don't think of it. I try not to, I try not to think about it, frankly. Um, I don't know if you are different, but I'm not meticulous about my creative process. If, if I want to write something, I write it. What, I try what, to pick, listen. What, what I find is that there are some things that often work for me and Rachel, partly because uh, writing a novel is a marathon, not a sprint. Poetry is a little bit more of a sprint uh, in that sense. So now let's need to sort of plug it. Sorry? I, I, mean, I mean, I think reading, well, who cares about Ezra? He's dead. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, like um, Mary Rufel said, she just listens for the knock, you know, and, yeah. and and I think that's the best thing you can do. And I try to write as much as I can, I read as much as I can. I think reading really helps, and reading good things and not rubbish, and just forcing yourself to 
to, to be jealous of other people and be like, ha ah, why are they so good? And then... No, I, I mean, I, I want to add to that. It's not always about envy or jealousy and why are they so good, I can do better. It's sometimes also a conversation. I mean, you read someone, he might or might not be better than you, but he or she, but they say something that you want to respond to, like in a good conversation, and you're writing almost to answer or respond to what they're saying. So add, oh, no, 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 you're missing out on this point. Or I, I want to add something to what you just said. I, yeah, I try. I mean, I try to like. Yeah, just I think just reading is the best thing for me, probably the best way I get creative. Um, but it's like the poems. Nobody cares. I mean, nobody's wait. Nobody's waiting for them. <laughs> two, two questions from the front, Brian and and the lyrical. You call yourself a lyrical poet. What do you mean by lyrical? What is the lyric, and how do you put it into your poem? I don't know. That's what, I'm just I'm just saying what what I've been told I am. Um, I'm. I think I think all it means is that you're talking and you're not like a strict form. Like uh, there's like formalism and then there's avant-gardeism and then there's lyricism. And I guess we're lyrical, but I don't think like I'm not trying to. I don't play loot or anything. <laughs> I mean, it's a ridiculously archaic sounding term. I mean, it, on one level, it's a very it's a very limiting term, but it's it's often in use for sort of writing that that reads well uh, in on the tongue. That, that has a certain trip, a deep trip, or a certain rhythm. Sounds good when read about. Generally, I mean, it's a very, very loose term, really. And it's often used by avant garde poets to put down <laughs> traditional. Well, all but it's quite like houseboat poetry, you know? I mean, it is often, yeah. you know, it, man, look at that bee pollinate something. Ooh, that's a metaphor for doing it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They are wrong. Yeah, they are wrong. Uh, there was a question from the man. So, which poets are you jealous of? Or which ones are you reading a lot That's of a good, now? Oh, there's so many. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, the poets that I wish I could be. Um, I mean, there's a lot. Um, Mary Rupert remains totally uh, amazing to me and just blows my mind every time I read her. Uh, Robert Bly's work I need to read a lot more of because I love it. Michael Burkhard, um, my old professor in Syracuse University, is is really one of the, the greats. Um, who else I love? Hayden Carruth, you know, one of the first poets I ever read was Hayden Carruth, just only because he had a book titled Scrambled Eggs and Whiskey, and I thought, yeah, <laughs> I, like, uh, I like both those things. Um, it's a really good book. Uh, I'm trying to think who else I've been reading a lot of. Uh, John Glende is incredibly admirable on the on the Scottish front. Kai Miller, who works in Scotland, is amazing. Glasgow man. Glasgow man. Jamaican. Jamaican Glasgow. Yeah, that that's more than enough of me telling you names of people. Things. But they're all good. Please email me and I'll tell you books. Yes. Sir. Yeah. When did you first start to see yourself as a poet, or that was something you wanted? Oh, uh, well, I guess those are two different questions. I wrote poems for a long time without thinking of myself as a poet. I only call myself a poet now uh, because uh, they put it into my job title. And, Imagine that. And, and also once on a lark going through uh, border control in, um, from Syria to Lebanon, I wrote poet on my little thing. And this guy came out and was like, oh, the general is a poet. And he came out and was like really excited to meet me. And I was like, okay, actually, this is a pretty good occupation to put down. So uh, yeah, I started using it as that. But I, I, I would always prefer to say uh, I write poems more than I would try to consider myself a poet. Sometimes it's just easier to say poet, but I think that comes with a lot of lofty, ridiculous notions and baggage. I don't you know can also you get you in trouble at bullet control, depending on where you are. <laughs> you can get you a strip search. <laughs> what? Really? I speak from there. I'll <laughs> 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 story I don't like to talk about. Poet. What sort of poetry do you write? <laughs> Step over the side. <laughs> Any other question? Anyway. What is your culture like in America? Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy. Uh, what is my, my like my personal culture? Your, your, I mean, your, your national culture in America. What your idea of it? Uh, your idea of it? Broad? Um, wow! Wow! 
Well, that's a hard question. What is my idea of our natural culture? I'm so disappointed in America right now. I'm just speaking really <laughs> negatively, and I don't really feel that negatively about it. What I want to find out is that what is the culture in America look like? What does the cultural scene look like? Yeah, the culture is something like that. I mean, for example, that you know, give us the culture of something. You know, I mean, whatever the cultural, <clears throat> cultural, uh, you know, you know what about culture something in America is says I haven't been in yet. The thing about I guess the thing about American culture in terms of like production of art, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but is that what you mean? Like like it's 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 scrappier and more intense because there's not a lot of support and it does lead to some really vast amounts of innovation in a really interesting way. I think that's a really good thing, but you have to get there through a very hard road and you have to starve and you have to find it. And sometimes it means commercial, right? It's a little bit too commercial and that's because people need to make money to pay rent because there's not going to be welfare, there's not going to be social security, there's not going to be anything that's going to help you, there's not grants, particularly, you know, things aren't particularly well funded, so you're going to pay and you need to get tickets and bums and seats and people to buy your book. And on one hand, I think that's a really, really healthy way to produce culture because it keeps you like muscular and honest, but also it can also lead to being a really dangerous way to produce culture because you can become uh, derivative and safe. So it's got these two sides to it, you know, and and so like anywhere else. But I think that's the same problem with creative, you know, like places that have loads of grants. You get people who are really good at getting grant work, getting, getting grant funding, but they're not producing particularly good work. They're producing particularly good applications, and they're pretty dull writers. So there is that, but I think like Part of what America makes American culture for a long time so strong is that has been that like scrappiness and, and that ability to change very quickly and to react to things very quickly. Um, you know, and I and I I still rate American poetry pretty highly, like very very highly. It's still the, the voices that I kind of tend to turn to when I need uh, to to hear a voice. Uh, I don't know if that's because of the, if that's because of my background, or I guess it's because of my background, but I, I do turn to American poets much more than I turn to English or Scottish or UK poets um, uh, for my own for my own pleasure, for my own, for my own education. It's probably a bit myopic, honestly. But. Two questions. Uh, one, one. Uh, shall we take? Uh, let's chat. What were you? Give you an example of a smart boy, like a boy that plays in the reader. A smartphone yeah. that plays with the reader? Yeah, like, like tickle you? Okay, I know. Mean, <laughs> uh, like, uh, like the last night it was the night it goes like this. Capture this moment, think not of it. You hold it in your hand for this moment of time is gone yet again. So, uh, like from this interview, it's like you're telling the reader to capture this moment in time. That is going to say you're going to miss because you're spending this time reading this line. So, is, is there, do you have any other examples of such such of poems? Like, like is there like a book of such poems? It's like playing with the reader. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question, like an addressing the reader. And I mean, there's all those riddle poems, but I wouldn't particularly recommend those as anything good. I mean, no, that's a good poem. That's a deep poem. It's very, it sounds very zen. I, I can't think of anything that I would, not off the bat, that I would be able to say, they sit in my room, maybe I'll be. A couple. Uh, I think about writers, about writers in general, you, you talk after the, after the reading and, and I can give you a list. I'll take this first time. Um, what do you think about collaboration between, say, like artists and poets and like, musicians and poets and multidisciplinary sort of working together? Yeah, I think it's super important. I think for poetry it's probably more important than for the other artists, I think part of the problem with poetry in general is its hermeticness and its sealed offness uh, from the rest of the arts. And I think we've kind of done that to ourselves. I don't know why. Maybe we feel safer uh, just being all miserable together. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's great. I mean, I think it's one of the most important things. And I think you know, certainly in my life, I've always worked as a in collaboration with people. I ran an arts collective. I uh, have, have been part of an arts collective uh, for you know 15 years. Um, worked with visual artists, musicians, other poets, um, and it's been very, very good for me. And it challenges you to do other things uh, and try 
and, and to solve different types of problems than you would just sitting in your room. I think I think it's great. Yeah, very pro uh, collaboration and multidisciplinary fun because it's playful, right? It's also playful, and I think it's good to remember that we're supposed to be enjoying ourselves despite ourselves. Well, just keep coming, don't they? Just be <laughs> never. Just just like, don't you raise their hand anymore. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, was, I was just thinking, you were telling us about how you wanted to move your own poetry towards a more deep image, visceral, feeling kind of writing. But have you had other such impulses before? Do you consciously try to move your poetry away from being something to try and occupy a new space? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Can you tell us more about that experience? Was yeah, maybe give some ideas. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, yeah, I guess I have had that experience before, but but I guess I probably I can't think of it. I mean, the experience of doing this is like I just basically um, you know what happened. I wrote a book, uh, I finished a book, and it felt done. And I think you know when you get that book out, you have a choice to do the same thing again. And I've always admired artists who evolve. I guess. Yeah, well, you know, you know, and the reason we get sick of our favorite bands is because they put out their third album and it sounds like them kind of <clears throat> doing their music but not as good anymore. So I was just really conscious that I needed to learn new things and to try to sound different. And so, um, yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, I was really influenced by the beat, so I tried to do that. And then I started to read other things and I kind of understood that, I don't know, there's this whole compression thing and you can, you can really make a really tight poem. Uh, and that seemed to suit this work because it was all about, like after the fact, I started to understand why I was writing it. Is this really boring for people? No, no. Okay. Because okay. um, <laughs> I can talk about this for way longer than I should. Um, just throw something at me when you're bored. So, you know, for, 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 for a bunch of characters who can't talk about themselves or talk to their partners or their children, um, they, that kind of compression seemed to make sense, right? Uh, that, that make, you understand that? I guess it like, formally made sense to, to do. So I understood why I was doing it. I controlled it. I being controlled it. Uh, the next book, you know, I kind of went through uh, uh, you know, a pretty rough breakup. Um, and you know, that kind of notion of compression didn't exist for me anymore. It was a spiral and a swirl and a, uh, you know, that you know, like when you go through some kind of trauma, that gerbil in your brain keeps running around on the wheel, and you just keep thinking the same thoughts, and it's fucking crazy. So I wanted to, like, the poem started to reflect that state of mind. The form started to, does that, yeah? And so I wanted to open the poems back up and to allow that madness and that craziness and that kind of shaky, terror, worry, heartbreak thing into the work itself. And so that is a conscious decision, uh, but it also was, unconscious and unavoidable because I couldn't at that time have written a very concise poem about my heartbreak. It's, it's interesting to say that because I had a similar experience about the past couple of years, like five years. Not, not, not the trauma necessarily, but two things. One is encountering Eastern European poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, it is often not, not compressed, quite, quite deep images, uh, quite all over the place, quite fragmented. And that comes both from their history and from the games they're trying to play, language against senses, against history, against politics, and that was one. The other thing was I, I reached a point, having done having that book for the Rico narrative, so, <coughs> so to yeah. speak, that and it started to feel irresponsible to depict the world as if it made sense because it, it actually happened. That way. Um, and, and in a sense, it was it was it was pretense. I mean, you know, it really doesn't always make as much sense. You know, a, a, a line a line like what you just said. Uh, my my love comes on two camels, sung sung by three horsemen or whatever. Uh, on some level, makes as much sense as describing and painful and, and uh, minute detail uh, what you have for breakfast with your lover. And they're both beautiful. I mean, they're yeah, both exactly. beautiful and things, and, and, and I'm just hopeful. That, and I just didn't want to do the same thing. You get bored of yourself, right? Yeah. You get bored of yourself. Yeah, there was you get that. bored of writing the same thing. And you're like, ooh, I wrote all the good poems that I can write in that way, you know? And, you know, you have to move. I mean, all I think all artists have periods. That's why, 
you know, you read about these artists, especially in visual arts, right? They have periods of where they're doing one thing, they just work. They work that seam until it's over. And then when it's, they're dried up, they move on to another thing. Tell us a little bit about that, that one-on-one -on -one thing with the few and all that, that you've, you've been doing that, you know, Yeah, I guess that ties into the multi Yeah, exactly. Uh, I have two little, like, one-on-one -on -one shows. The first one is called Red Like Our Room Used to Feel, uh, which was started out as a CD of collaboration I did with a friend of mine. I had these very soft poems I wanted to read, and I didn't want to read them to people like you. Uh, because, no thanks, man, I'm sorry. It's impersonal. I meant you as an aggregate, not you personally. I didn't want to read them in a crowd. I think when I'm talking to a crowd, um, uh, frankly, I really, really want you to like me. Um, and that changes the way the way I read and present my own work. Uh, so I wanted to have this these like weird little soft poems read in an intimate space. So I created a little bedroom and I would bring you in and I'd give you a cup of tea or a glass of port and um, I would just sit you there and read, essentially read you some poems in this room, uh, just me and you. Uh, some people found that awkward. <laughs> Even I found it awkward. I did a lot, I made a lot of effort to make it not awkward. It's very clear that I will not touch you and you cannot touch me. <laughs> why, why did it have to be a bedroom? Because of that, that I just it's kind of into this so room. intimacy and I wanted a little level of weird romance. <laughs> But not quite. Look, so because you just want to I mean, touch, I mean, but you want to imagine. I want to do the thing that could maybe possibly happen. But not with me necessarily, just in general. That I don't know, I think that's a really private and intimate space to be in a bedroom with somebody. And I think we've all been there in that kind of like, I don't know what to do in this space. And then just to read a poem in that, in that kind of headspace is... I don't know, I, thought it, I just thought it was a cool idea. I always thought the Beatles Norwegian wood was essentially. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Didn't he burn her house down at the end of that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm um, good. They say that no matter what kind of writer you are, whether you write a novel or a poet, whatever, the first book that you ever write is your most innocent one. And I wonder what your comments are on that. And whether when you're working on a book number two, three, five, ten, whatever it is, if you feel that in some way, in order, how do you draw inspiration or does it become Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess uh, one, I'm trying to get more innocent um, if I can. I'm really yeah, but it's a good that's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, certainly, there's levels aspects of na naivety in it, but I think um, yeah, I want I want I want I don't know because I haven't finished a, a second I finished a second manuscript and I don't quite know what it is yet. I'll know in about a year's time and then uh, and I'll tell you more about it. Call me. Um, what was the other question? The, the, that question? Well, the first one just, just putting your whole soul into everything. Oh, how contrived is it? No, 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 the first book is so innocent because it just basically, it's, your, it's all of you. And so they say that your first book is always, you know, sort of in some ways. No, I was always very, I don't, I don't agree with that for me. I mean, I always was aware that it was only a part of me. These are only parts of me. I mean, they talk to like Tom York from radio and they're like, you're really depressed, aren't you? And he's like, no, I just write songs when I'm depressed. Um, these are only aspects of our personality and aspects of our lives. Um, my whole self isn't in the book because the most of the rest of myself isn't that interesting. One of the things you, you <laughs> one of the things you realize is not so much that your first book is the most innocent, but you figure out after a while that your publishing is a contrived act. Publishing is a public act. You are fashioning yourself. You just become a little more conscious that you're doing that. You're doing that with your first book as well, but you just become more aware of yourself doing it, and so you more carefully, you more deliberately shape how you do that. Uh, and some people try to, some, some writers and artists try to reinvent themselves with every book to recapture that, that sense, perhaps, a little bit of that sense of excitement about having a book out, having a, an album out, having a project out. And I guess we're both a little bit like that. We try to be very different between books. Um, and you almost don't want to repeat yourself because it would be dumb, it would be lame yeah. on a certain level. Try to do something a bit different. But it is, I mean, publishing is, is, is a deliberate act, it's a public act. It is, it is 
in itself artificial. What do you think about publishing when you write? Because I'm one of the ones that like, so I think there's two types of yeah. writers that they, they work towards a book. And they're like, I'm going to do yeah. a book about the human body, and I'm going to write a poem about the nose, and the mouth, and the shoulders, and the tip of the like. Okay, that's very methodical, and when you have the whole body, that's, that's it, your book's done. And then there's the other ones that kind of seem to just write as much as they can, and then they're like, yeah, oh, okay, read a book from it. oh shit, I've been writing about water for the last four yeah. years, yeah. I guess I got a book yeah. about water, yeah. yeah. No, I, I tried to do the, the sort of deliberate, that's what to a, a book for my second book, and it did not turn out that way. <laughs> Yeah, that's good, but because like, but that's, that's fine. who's the guy, Stephen Spender, I think, if he said something like, if, if you sit out, if you set out, you have to be surprised by what you end up creating, and Stephen Spender said, if you set out to write a, a poem about two dogs fucking, at the end of the day, you're just going to have a poem about two dogs fucking, like, like that shouldn't, that, that's not a good thing, Yeah, you know, like, you have to take the, the byway yeah. and get to somewhere else. I just want to be aware, I think she had that up before that. Thank you. Thank you. I gave you the lousy answer. I'm sorry. That's, that's fine. So maybe, maybe before back to Tracy, there was a question. Was there a question over the end? No. Maybe she's waving. Maybe she's like. Oh. Tracy. <laughs> to a certain extent, you, 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 talk, you were talking earlier about deep, deep meaning. Was it deep meaning? Is it deep, deep, deep image. image. Yeah. Deep image. It, can, to a certain extent, you. It would be difficult to get to deep image without <coughs> vulnerability, without allowing yourself to be to be vulnerable to kind of as a step as a further step from naivety, would it not? Vulnerability, naivety as vulnerability. Well, no, I mean you were talking about remaining naive, but I'm saying it, it perhaps perhaps more than naive. It is allowing yourself to be more vulnerable in a way um, to, to, to get that connection between you and the deep image. Sure, yeah, I, I guess so. I'm not sure yeah. if I've well, another, word, question, another word that has been used, another word that has been used, <laughs> another word that has been used in that context is risk. Yes. Yeah. The ability to How do you trust me. that the reader is going to be able yeah. to follow you into that hole enough mm -hmm. to get it? Get something and accept, and then you also will be good enough to themselves to accept that they do get it, even if they don't get it, which is a really hard thing as a reader. Yeah, and, and perhaps that's something that only that will only come with confidence as well, and having published a book or two. Or just not caring. Or not caring. Yeah. Yeah. Not caring is a lot of good things. Just and this where the traits and, and, and other stuff. I just have all time for some poems. Just. Um, some old stuff, some of your new stuff. Yeah, should we? All right, I mean, I was going to read, I'll, I'll read two old ones, uh, two more old ones, and then, uh, you know, I'll read a couple new ones, and then you can tell me, how, I mean, how, what level of bored are you, tired are you guys? On one of scale, one to ten. Zero? Zero being the most bored and tired. <laughs> right, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's give him a round of applause, and we'll give him his encouragement measurement. That's right. Alright, let's talk about sex. Woo! Is that okay? Can I do that? <laughs> so, um, alright, so, um, yeah, this is gonna sound like a, a, a dirty poem. Um, I want to assure you that it's uh, deeply sensitive. Um, I hope it's also very. <laughs> is it gonna be vulgar? Okay. I, I, would, I would say you can go as far as vulgar, but I assure you at the end, deeply sensitive. And, um, uh, I don't know, it's about language, which I think is something that's always interesting uh, in a foreign country, especially in Singapore. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't ask you guys this, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, like, you're in a relationship, right? Some people, things are, in the beginning of a relationship, things are, um, they're frequent, a bit more busy, and, uh, <laughs> and as you get more comfortable, things maybe slow down? I guess is the way to put it, and so I was uh, bothered by this, and I thought, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to blame myself. I knew that I, it wasn't my fault, and I didn't really want to blame her because it didn't seem fair. So I thought, um, I thought I, I thought I'd blame God. 
All right, so this is from her point of view. She says, one evening, we were sitting in his apartment, and he says, little friend. So it's everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he says, little friend. <laughs> like, imagine Vladimir Putin, again, saying to you, little friend. If any, if Vladimir Putin ever said to you, little friend, no, you would just see that. I still think out of his mouth it would be terrifying. <laughs> like, that's what like, a mobster says before he's going to kill you. <laughs> uh, Come on, bro. Yeah. So he said, little friend, by now you know what I'm like. I'm, ba I'm basically not a very convenient person. <laughs> Which is so sweet. So, and then, he, and then he goes on to describe himself. He, he's not a talker. He can be pretty harsh. Can hurt your feelings and so on. Not a good person, he says, to spend your life with. And uh, and he says so. He says to this woman. He says to to Ludmilla. Ludmilla. Yeah. Uh, he says to her. Over the course of three and a half years, you've probably made up your mind. And uh, and uh, she thought, oh man, we're totally breaking up. <laughs> And, and so she said, yeah, I've made up my mind. And then he said, um, with a, with, she says, a little doubt in his voice. And he says, really? That's when I knew we were definitely breaking up, she says. And he says, in that case, I love you, and I propose we get married on such and such a day. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty amazing to just be like, look, I suck. I suck. You don't want to be with me. And then, yeah, right? that's sweet. That is sweet. It does sound sweet, right? Except for the whole little friend thing, though. <laughs> I'm so bad at very romantic, too. My little friends. I said yes because it was raining. Or maybe it wasn't. I can never remember if we had tea and cake, or if it was only brown bread his mother left on the counter. His white hands, I know, they were folded like napkins, impossible to pick up. I said yes because his eyes were blinking out a code I could almost break. I had a horse, and my horse could speak only to me, and he called me little friend and spoke his weakness. He was not a talker, would never remember a date or a detail. I would never see him rushing a spontaneous box of shoes in my size, my color. He would not drive all night for shoes. He could not name my eyes or say father's hometown. He could not guess the road to the hospital, name the women on my shift. And he promised never to say again what he'd say, breaking a piece of bread, forking a cake or whatever he did, his eyes blinking, definite, his hands slowly moving across the table to me, like horses, like quiet and shy children, like flowers opening in the spring, budding and shaking in slow motion, there on the table, his secret hands of paper, his magazines of ammunition, his strong, lonely hands, begging me to say yes, and his words saying no, saying he was only a man, and not a good man, not a horse I could break, but one that would stand by my side, loan me a back as I needed. That wasn't too mean, was it? All right, let's see. Um, I, I had this, um, I have this, um, show where I give you a Viewmaster, like a little, you know a Viewmaster? Do you guys know a Viewmaster, Jack? Yeah, the old red plastic things? And, um, and, and we have four slides, and I can take you either to, to Mecca, the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, the River Nile, or Tulip Time in Holland, and then you get to sit in the little Viewmaster for about five minutes, and my friend plays a little live soundtrack, and I read you a little poem. So um, imagine you have a Viewmaster on your face or something, maybe, or don't. Um, this is called Mecca. Every day, five times, stare ahead and bow. Paradise is out there. Not at the shopping center, but walking around the center. Wearing a two-piece like anyone else. Thirsty hair on your open chest, searching for water. The striving fast, walk fast. The desperation, fast walk fast. 
till you turn and find yourself there. Shops close and men fold their wallets. Our streets are for worship again. Do you have the word God in your vocabulary? Or do you have a secret place where you hide what you won't call sin and couldn't call trust? Or do you shoot your sorrows down a glass slide towards a thousand taut and pink trampolines? Don't ask where I am coming from or who is my father. I am always uncomfortable in a crowd. Could not hunt, cut trees, or fight. We all forget death is on every shoulder you can stand by. I have stood shoulder to shoulder with a hundred other men and knew, as we all know, the best smell is bread. You cannot always say goodbye to those you love. You will never get so tired of suffering. Each one as brother will stop and rest. Should God want my soul, he shall have it. You're a good man when the sun is set. God doesn't look at your eyes, your shirt, the color of your skin. God looks for your heart. Very lonely. The real point is to sleep again under stars. Last poem, thank you. That's the right answer. I'm tired of myself. I don't know how you feel. <laughs> All right, this one, oh, maybe, wait, which one do I want to read? Um, yeah, I'm going to do a different one. Which one is it? Uh, uh oh, I should have not deleted that. Uh, talk amongst yourselves, or don't, wait, don't talk amongst yourselves. That's a terrible idea. Okay, um, this poem uh, doesn't have a title. It has just a quote from David Lynch, which probably means it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Uh, and what David Lynch said was, he said, it doesn't matter what you know about the other places if you're still trapped in the building. My brother phones and asks only if I am in the next room. I am in that room and the room after that. And outside is a police station, a bar, a hospital, a hotel. Outside is a wind that wakes me from dreaming my brother calling me from the other room. And the dream is so like a film, I forget that in this building there is a bedroom, a bathroom, a kitchen presumably. In my stirring, all I expect to find are corridors that connect as a groin connects. And for months I think about other places, as if I know them as I know my brother. I think about the bars and even at times the lines on the streets and once or twice I believe I can depart the building. But I only find corridors, never the hard bush of the hills or the wind of the valley. And eventually I will forget other places, the medicine store, the meat store, the windows of hair cutters, and I will make an acceptance of here of the coins which have left circulation. And on that day, I will not dream, my brother, but will speak to you of love for my building and what I have burnt inside it to stay warm. What fires I have made of myself and yourself and the mattress we slept on, the pillow beneath your back, your forgotten hairs and brushes. And I guess I shall forget you too and the night when my brother phoned from a dream and how on that night I knew you were no longer in places I could even imagine. And therefore it didn't matter or I didn't matter and I want a glass of water now and a hallway that is not a groin and a cat to cross my shadow and there will be a day I'll depart to all that the world is. I will walk from asylum like the Indian in that film where he walks in white to the end of the reel towards a fog which he may think he believes he knows. Ladies and gentlemen,
<laughs> You're welcome. All right, uh, Ryan, Ryan will be hanging around 